Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody who's present and online with us today. Just to let everyone know online that if you want to participate in the Q&A session afterwards, you will need to register your email address with uh, the live stream platform in order to chat with me afterwards. So I'm Shannon Harper. I am the Educational Technology Coordinator here at Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Some people would say that I am you know, tech support, uh, glorified tech support, uh, but I also feel that my vocation is an opportunity to serve as what I would call a tech chaplain. And I focus on empowering end users instead of just fixing their problems. I like to focus on educating people uh, rather than um, here I fixed your problem, uh, see you later. I'd rather have a discussion with them about uh, what's going on, uh, maybe talk to them about how they're using the technology, uh, things that they might want to do different to increase their product productivity rates and um, possibly train them a, a new way to do things. Um, possibly they were just doing something an old way that they were trained or just had figured it out themselves and, and maybe there's a shortcut that I can provide for them that uh, saves them time and energy. I have a passion in helping people who help people. Uh, this stems from uh, childhood passions uh, growing up in a Southern Baptist church. Uh, I was fascinated by technology from uh, the very beginning. Uh, I come from a family of uh, computer engineers, so I was always around computers and to mix my lifestyle at church with technology was, was a dream come true for me when I was a teenager and uh, started working in the video booth. I didn't understand exactly the extent of how important that service was for people. We were taping the sermons for the shut-ins and as a child I just thought, oh, push buttons in church, I don't have to sit still and I can do what I want and nobody can see what I'm doing. I can draw pictures, I can uh, talk to my friends secretly, whatever. Uh, but it wasn't until later that I saw that my passion was going to feed um, people in the future and be able to help them um, get messages that are important for changing their lives and, and uh, improving the quality of their lives. So my experience in the church quickly transitioned to being the uh, tech person for uh, a gospel quartet and I traveled with them and uh, was very fascinated by operating the equipment and, and how it, their service provided life for uh, the people that we visited, the different congregations that we went to and uh, I was very energized by this process and I thought well I'll just be an audio engineer and uh, work with rock stars and we will uh, travel the world and uh, we'll always have a party so uh, it was it was very close uh, into my first semester of, of college that I just I knew I was not made for that lifestyle and so I, I went through a period of grief of not being able to fulfill my passion um, so I dimmed that down a little bit what I didn't know is 15 years later that I am working with rock stars um, working with social justice rock stars, uh, theological rock stars, I'm working with people who have passion for helping the oppressed. And so I feel that my passion has, ha has been rekindled through uh, my learning here at the seminary and um, I feel very excited about this opportunity to use my passions and mix those with the other passions here with the rock stars so that we can help change the conditions that we are, we are under in this, this world. One thing that I have experienced as a tech chaplain is the level of anxiety that people have using technology and uh, what that does with their, how they perform, uh, whether they're teaching or they're giving a sermon or uh, just a presentation on um, training for employees. Like the, the level of anxiety that people have using technology is, has created, um, when, when you have a leader that has a loss of confidence, then, then that trickles down and it creates a problem with your team. So I like to remind people that computers are not inherently intelligent. Human intelligence had to put the PC together and program the PC to operate how it is operating or whatever piece of technology. A human had to interact with the process of building that technology. So the computer itself, is not trying to hurt your feelings. 
It's, it's not trying to ruin your day. It's, it's literally having its own issue and it has nothing to do with what you do or do not know. So <laughs> I'd like to remind people that computers are not really smart. Also, I meet people where they're at. So some people have quite, you know, a lot of intelligence about, te about technology and lots of people don't really have any intelligence about technology. It just depends on where you're coming from. And so I try to have a conversation with people to try to figure out where they're at and where we can communicate so that we can come to a solution about the issue we're having about the technology. Again, the anxiety that people have regarding the operation of technology it, it's an internal process that comes back on them psychologically and spiritually, I've noticed. Um, a lot of negative self-talk, and then, again, productivity issues and um, <coughs> self-confidence, self-esteem. Uh, it can create a, a sliding effect of, of negative energy and um, bad emotions. So I try to uplift people, empower people. It, it's just a tool. You did not create this tool. You are just trying to interact with this tool. So again, I, I meet people where they're at. I ask questions, I have discussions, and I try to figure out how we can re resolve the solution without creating some other issue with uh, emotions or increased anxiety. So this is my attempt at radical practical theology. So this is a ministry that seeks to help people build technological platforms with the intention of spreading knowledge and hope. In <clears throat> Heidi Campbell's Digital Religion, Understanding Religious Practice in New Media Worlds, she says technology is a liberator. Optimistic responses associate technology with a liberating force with the potential to overcome hunger, disease, and poverty and to produce economic growth resulting in an overall improvement of the human condition. This is what I feel about technology. Uh, yes, there's bad aspects about technology. I, I, I am one, a lot of people say, you have the patience for the technology. No, I just, I know how the technology can behave or not behave. Um, I, I've learned to be patient with it, uh, but also I have my moments where I say Satan's in the copier. So <laughs> it does feel like something's against you when things aren't working. Um, but ultimately I feel like technology is a tool to help us become a better collective. So I try to focus on uh, the positive aspects of what technology can do for us and also just be aware that there are issues. There's issues in everything. Technology has issues. I'm a professional who is able to interact with technology and resolve those issues. Some people are professionals with people and they interact with people and they resolve their issues and just people have their thing and technology is uh, something that I have a passion for teaching and sharing and I can see its potential, so I, I try to lift that up. So in the basics of an online ministry or nonprofit organization, uh, it's not much different than the logistics of a for-profit purpose. Um, you still need the basics of uh, a hosting account, a website, an email account. You need people to help you with this, whether they're on your team or you're paying somebody. Uh, those logistics are pretty much the same. Uh, what's different is often ministries and nonprofits do not have a budget or a low budget. Uh, for profit agencies are able to pay technology professionals and integrate new systems a lot quicker because of that, the revenue they have. Uh, nonprofit agencies and churches have a slow, uh, they work slower because of, of the lack of resources they have. So um, this is where my fire kicks in. Like people have information they need to share. People need to read and learn about information to liberate themselves from some oppressive state they're in. Uh, sermons need to be heard uh, across the world or uh, a workshop needs to be shown in five or six different church congreg congregations on a Wednesday night to learn about basic computer skills. I find that the message is not getting to the people who need it. And so technology can, can resolve that gap. This is, this is where I'm gonna jump in and 
and lead this process to remove anxieties and and also uh, prepare people to jump further into the technological age. This, if you think about the printing press and how the printing press worked and how that changed intelligence and how that changed communities and how uh, information was able to be spread to give hope and inspiration, uh, I feel technology is a very similar tool. People ask me often how how do I get online? How do I get a website? Uh, where can I learn to build a website? What do we need to get started? What types of platforms are there? Are they free? Are they cheap? Uh, people also tell me they, they don't really have any money to build a website. They don't have time to learn how to build a website. They don't have any experience with websites, social media, email, or, or computers. They don't want to get on Facebook, uh, social media. They don't want to write a blog. They, they really they don't want to mess with the website uh, because of all the negativity, but they know they need to be online. So there's a lot of pushback. Uh, I encourage people, you know, meet people where they're at. People are online. So we have to go there. It, it's very similar to uh, street ministries. Uh, we have to go to the streets even though we're not accustomed to those cultures and how they operate there in those sections of town. We still have to go to the people uh, whether we feel like it's a good place or not. One of the things I want to focus on here is exactly how to launch and manage your online presence. You don't have a lot of money, if you don't have money at all, if you don't have a lot of time to learn or maintain new technologies, if you don't have the technical experience to do much more than check your email or your Facebook or Instagram, not to be offensive, but people have their preferences and their lifestyles, uh, I'd like to lead you into a space where you can have free and low cost solutions and we'll design some sort of custom strategy for your organization, your ministry, and, um, and then in the end I'll mention some online resources, but the online resources will, uh, I will provide those afterwards with our online link so that you can download those and go through those in your own time. So David Burgot wrote in the Ministry of Digital Age, as digital technologies change so quickly, there's no way for an organization to constantly be aware of all the newest innovations and in technologies. I think we all feel the same when I say we're overwhelmed by how much there is. And this, this is a stopping point for many agencies who are looking to have an online presence. Is, uh, they want it, they know they need it, despite their, their opinions and values of, of how social media works or online uh, presence works. Um, but what do we choose? There's like a billion of everything. Fifteen years ago, it was you picked a website from this company and uh, you did or didn't buy a programmer from the company or you knew somebody and you only had four or five choices for email and so now there's, there's a lot. And it really just depends on what you want and what your preferences are. So we'll start with building a foundation. You have to really dig down into what you're wanting to do. Uh, ask the questions. Uh, why do you even want to be online? A lot of it is that's where the people are. Um, but it could be um, it's a different way to uh, transmit your message. or it, There's different reasons why you want to be online, but you need to be clear about why you want to be online. You need to focus on that. It needs to be a part of your online mission. Then you need to assess what tools you're already familiar with. Do you know anybody on your team or are you familiar with answering email or uh, creating a website or starting a social media page? Uh, what are you familiar with? What are you not familiar with? And just assess that. Something else that I ask uh, people to do when they're looking to start this process is find out what your peers are doing or competitors. It depends on how you want to look at that. What are your peers doing? Um, see what their websites look like, what are they offering on their websites, uh, compare um, what you like and you don't like with each of those websites and just kind of get an idea of what you want to do for, for your online platform. Some basic tools for your foundation should be an email. Now you want at least two emails. So you want an email that 
the people can contact you with. And then you want an email that's only attached to your social media and website accounts. This is a security thing. If somebody breaks into your social media or your website account, do you really want them to have all your customer information and your, and your information email that they email you back and forth with? So yes, it's, it can be annoying to have more than one account to, to test or, or uh, to check, but for security purposes, you want to tie one email to your other online pl platforms and one email that is mainly for communication between you and the people you're trying to reach. You do need a website. It's just the part where we're in that time where everybody has a website, everybody has a web presence, whether it's personal or business or uh, just informational. There's billions of websites. So for your foundation, your online presence, you need a website. You do need a social media account. I would suggest two social media accounts. It really just depends on your market, who your audience is. You know, some. A lot of people will immediately say, well, I already have a Facebook. Well, if your target audience is youth groups between the ages of 10 and 14, they're not on Facebook. So what's the point? So you have to really think about what social media would be beneficial for you. And then you need an online collaboration platform. And this is for you and your team or people that you, you do business with or um, I'm thinking about you know guest speakers who need to share uh, files with with the guests. So it's easier if you are able to have a platform online where you can share links and images and videos and uh, have conversations with each other and uh, keep your emails together and just it's kind of like a big folder for your team. And so. Uh, some online collabora collaboration platforms come with doc sharing platforms, some don't, but I highly suggest that you have some sort of platform to share documents online. Um, it may or may not be that collaboration platform. So you want to develop ideas and relationships. Where do you want to put your focus? You have to think about that. You ask your team that. You ask yourself that. What is the purpose of your organization, your ministry, and how are you going to put that energy forth? You want to build relationships with people to determine their needs. So, like I said, if a youth group, 10 to 14 years old, their need is not a Facebook group. You have to ask them what they need, read books about what that age group is doing or that generation is doing or um, people with these lifestyles are doing. You have to read about the people you're trying to reach and you have to find uh, oh, their needs so that you can have a point A to B process. It helps with your outcome. How will your online presence represent your organization with integrity? This can get kind of messy. And some people know what I'm talking about. And it could be personal social media pages versus an organizational social media page and they're tied together. <coughs> um, how are you going to post? How are you going to react to the world around you on your social media page, your organization? And I suggest using productivity tools to determine progress and team needs. And what I mean by this is draw charts, you know, those silly thermometer charts that teams have and reach the goal and then it explodes, you know, somebody that colors a lot of red at the top. Like <laughs> your team, especially yourself, if this is just you at the beginning, you really need some way of tra tracking your progress so that you can see where you're at. And you can also assess this later. Maybe I shouldn't have done that during week two. Maybe I should have waited until week three. So there's cute little charts online. You know, there's a lot of different programs where you can assess your progress somehow or another. But use it. It's it's a good way to keep yourself on track, keep yourself account accountability, and you know, a little bit of everybody needs a cheerleader, especially when you're having a bad week with your mission. 
So E. Winger and Digital Habitat said the technology has changed how we think about communities and communities have changed our uses of technology. Let that sit for a minute. So I'm a person who was in the middle of the transition of internet was public and not. Uh, I was about 16, 17 years old when um, AOL came out and you could chat with people across the world and um, that changed my world. I actually uh, it increased my self-esteem and uh, I had a community of, of outside the box thinkers that I could talk to. I was in a small town. I felt like maybe I couldn't communicate well with my peers and so when the internet came to be I felt like there's some hope. So um, it did change, it changes the way we think about how community works, especially with the younger generations. Um, their idea of community immediately goes to the online presence. Like, they're not often thinking about community when we go down the street at the block party. They're thinking, oh, what Facebook group are you on when you talk about community? Our entire culture has changed. Um, I remember when Google came back with 13 results. So <laughs> now you have to be so specific and everybody can post something and you have to really discern what is valuable to you and what is gonna represent you when you share information that you've learned on the internet. So you should develop and adhere to your organizational values when you're developing your online presence should invest time and energy into incorporating organizational values. So take videos or small snippets of a testimony of somebody you've helped who is grateful for what you provided for them. So provide ways for people who do not know you or who are wanting to get to know you to connect with you on a personal level through other people's experiences. It's very powerful to use testimonies on your online presence. It's also important to connect with other groups who share your values. So don't think so much as competitors being competitors. You can share ideas, you can share people. Uh, again, this is for nonprofit and ministry, so often we're helping people. It's not about who gave away the most food to this individual this week versus this other uh, establishment. We're not having those competitive discussions. We don't feel those ways uh, when we're thinking about helping people. So uh, connect with other people that do the same thing that you are trying to do so that you can share ideas and help more people. Make sure you have content integrity on your, with your online presence. And what I mean by this is make sure you have permission to post a video of somebody at that rally last week Make sure you have permission to tag an individual that was um, sitting at lunch with you during the lecture today. You have to ask for permission, and often you have to have written permission unless they're a close friend or family member of yours. Uh, the internet is getting very tight about who, want, who wants to be online, who doesn't want to be online, what they want to be seen doing, what they don't want to be seen doing. Uh, you, better to be safe, get permission before you post something, and look into the copyright laws. This is becoming a, an issue with a lot of small churches who uh, created a website 10, 15 years ago and they used some Google image and there was not uh, any information on where that image came from and then now they're getting copyright infringement for something that they had no idea about because ministers had changed three times already. So just keep up to date on the copyright laws and what you use online. Again, uh, have per get permission for, for what you're doing. The next thing you wanna do is uh, establish connections and nurture relationships. You do wanna build a team. If you could, just you and one other person, Doing this by yourself is, is 
not a good idea and, and eventually becomes not feasible. Because if your goal is to reach more and more people, then you have to do more and more online work, more content, uh, more posting, and we all have lives, and it's not always just sitting and waiting to post the next post. So you need a schedule and you need a teammate. So build some sort of team, even if it's just one other person. You want to intentionally integ integrate online, uh, your I'm sorry, intentionally <coughs> integrate online mission and purpose with the community. So what that means is reach out. You want people to know about your online presence. So you can pass out flyers, you can have conversations at the flea market, you just have to get out into the community and talk about your online presence so that people can get to you online and share that information and everybody pretty much knows how information spreads on the internet. And once you get your team, you definitely want to focus on assigning different tasks to diff different team members. Different people have different skill sets and talents and the photography photographer may not be the good calendar keeper. You have to talk to your people, you have to assess what they can do and, and start divvying out the task. So I, I, I am a true believer in shared calendars. Some people may know how annoying it could be to get five emails about one meeting when they could have just looked at somebody's calendar. Or um, things change and somebody didn't get the memo uh, but if we had checked the calendar and we had that shared calendar, then we would have known. So it's a communication tool. Uh, share your calendar. Assign a reminder person. And I wouldn't say the reminder person should be the person who's the communication person. I know that doesn't really match up. So the communication person usually is someone who communicates to the team, we're doing this. Sometimes they take minutes, but they're they are in charge of the communication of the team and the purpose and the online presence. That person should not be the reminder person. The reminder person is literally that. Remind the person to send the email. Remind the person to uh, send in that photo to the publisher. Remind us that we have a meeting. Remind us tomorrow again that we have a meeting. You need a reminder person. It's redundant, it can be annoying, but it helps. And it helps with reducing conflict. Again, it's annoying, but it reduces conflict. Uh, again, visual progress charts and graphs, have that for you and your team to view. You wanna have a person or a couple people who are content creators and that's their focus. They create content and this is a big task to create content on your online presence and you don't want it to become stagnant so you have to have some a person or two to at least uh, always research, always write, always have something ready to go. Just be on your feet with the content. It cannot get stale or you people lose interest. And you have to have a tech savvy person. You just have to, or somebody that's willing to at least teach themselves. You have to. A lot of teams say we don't have a tech savvy person. You have to have a tech savvy person if you want to do tech things. Now, we can train ourselves to do anything we want to. People that, I've seen, all, people do what they want. I've seen all kinds of things. We can do what we want. If we really want to be online and we don't know how, we can figure it out. Think about when you were a teenager getting ready to drive. You'll figure it out. <laughs> Just think about the determination. So if you really want to be online and be productive online, somebody on your team or yourself will find the time and the energy to train yourself for themselves. So the next part of the strategy you want is uh, to focus on your communication and transmission of your mission and purpose. So you do have to have some sort of marketing strategy. 
John Dyer from the Garden to the City said, why are we doing all this technology? Why are we trying to reduce suffering in the world? And thankfully, technology is in fact accomplished to do that to some degree. So for ministry and nonprofit organizations, often you have conversations that are quite opposite if you were in a corporate culture. Uh, corporate cultures are profit-driven, um, product-driven, number-driven. Ministries and nonprofits are uh, service-driven, people-driven. We're doing this technology to reduce suffering. So when you get down and frustrated about not being able to learn how to put that picture in the top right-hand corner of your website, take a five-minute break. You're doing this for a bigger reason than to argue with that picture. So just take a couple minutes. Search engine optimization. Uh, this is a website geek term. Uh, what this means is how well can people find you online when they are searching for services or worship or um, whatever you do? Can you be found? What's, what is the technology behind the search engines that we, we work with? Search engine optimization is a very important part of your online presence being successful. It may, you may have to invest financially, uh, but again, you can train yourself to do it, and it, it's not impossible. It's really about words and placement of words on your website. Repost, repost, and repost. Uh, some of us may know that the algorithms of social media aren't flat. So just because I post something doesn't mean that all 500 of my friends see it. Um, this can become an issue when you're trying to get a message out. And so you kind of have to get creative with your strategy and how it works with the algorithms that are always changing. It's like the lottery for real, except it's social media. You want to cycle your information between your social media accounts, your website, and you want to reinforce these messages through emails. Redundant, can be annoying, but it's effective. Some people will choose to invest in social media boosting, it's where you pay the social media platform to put your message out, specific to users sometimes, but it's guaranteed to get out more than if you did not pay. A strategy that I found helpful a few years ago with these ever-changing algorithms with social media is I have created a social media team. Their task for me is just to repost. That's all they do for me as far as me getting my message out or me helping a client figure out how to get their message out more. I have them develop social media teams their task is just a repost or agree to be tagged because the more interactive pieces to a social media post the more views that it gets <clears throat> so you you want to build awareness after all of this so you'll have a platform you have it going and you're starting to figure out what you want what you don't want you just want to keep your awareness developing and open. You want to collect data, you want to evaluate your data, and you want to ask lots of questions about your data. This could take time. You may not do it your first year, uh, but you, you do need data to be able to make these assessments, but you want to build awareness about what changes that happened during what times, points in time of the year. Did you make any changes that made, made this post more had more views than the other, like you really want to dig into what changed in between all your data points and just be aware and you might be able to find some sort of um, secret token in your own data of how things will work better for your end users. In the hidden power of electronic culture, Hip, uh, Shane Hips said our electronic media has rekindled our interest in community and made us aware of our total interdependence 
on one another, even as it has increased our mobility, isolation, and individualism. You have to find out what's working out and what's not. Um, we are, how our interdependence of each other has changed through technology is, is alarming in some ways. Um, our sense of what community is, um, is very fragile because of how fast information travels now. So um, be, be very sensitive when you're evaluating what you're, what you're doing and what you're looking at, what your outcomes are, and know that, that the world around you also affects your data. So you want to recalibrate your efforts in the end. There's some adjustments you need to make. Um, do more research. You might find something that that was you were very curious about why something had changed in your data. Um, do more research on that. Uh, you might find some really valuable information on how you can deliver your message and, and talk to the end user, the customer, the client, the people you're trying to help. You can help them better if, if you take the time to uh, look at your outcome. And then prepare to start a new cycle of transmitting information. Everything's a cycle. Uh, we want to do better at what we're doing. We want to increase our efficiencies. And um, since we're people who help people, we want to make sure we help more people every year that we are in service of helping people. In Engaging Technology and Theological Education, Mary Hess wrote, we are truly embodied people, and using digital technologies to communicate does not erase that embodiment. Given the sheer reach and increasing ambiguity of digital technologies, our embodiment requires more thoughtful reflection. Okay, resources. I'm just gonna mention a few. A few that I feel are effective. Um, just like everybody, I don't have all day, every day to test all of the technologies out there. Um, so these are my recommendations based on my experience working with groups. Know that you can learn and teach yourself. Uh, there are resources online, YouTube videos, somebody's recorded how to do something very often, very often, or they've written about it in a blog post. So enough reading and watching <coughs> videos, you can train yourself to do what you need to do in, in these cases. But I'm not saying go train yourself to be a surgeon. I'm saying with technology, there are resources for you to spend time with yourself, to teach yourself what you need to know. When you buy products, often they come with their own support. Microsoft has their own support site. They have videos, they have uh, community forums, they have uh, knowledge base articles, they have, they have a lot of resources for you to learn how to use their products. Google's very similar. They offer um, a knowledge base online. Um, a lot of people have done YouTube videos on how to use Google services. And often third party vendors uh, have their own training um, or you can hire somebody from their agency to train you or your group. So there are resources for trainings. If you don't know how to do something, know that there's some method somewhere and even sometimes asking somebody is, is a way. And what I've found with Nonprofit services, so people who hold a 501c3, there are free products for you. So often you have to pay hosting services, um, even email services, um, sometimes marketing services. Uh, there are vendors who will give you their services if you provide proof that you are a nonprofit which is helpful because a couple hundred dollars a year in hosting, that's pro sometimes that's too much for people. But if it's free, it's 
Something else I've, I've used often uh, with Google is the Google Docs pl platform uh, for sharing and collaborating. Uh, if you have a Gmail account, you have access to a lot of different services that they're linked with. And so I'm not so much promoting their services as I am saying that uh, they're very helpful for organizations who do not have a budget or a low budget and do not have time to train themselves. So uh, Google's really good for if you need low cost or free services. The third party vendors that I've worked with with uh, hosting websites and uh, building websites and holding email accounts, uh, Network Solutions and GoDaddy are popular and uh, I've had really good experiences with them. There are other hosting options out there and it really just depends on what you're trying to do and what features you're looking for and how much time you have to train on their platform. And know that they have their own custom platforms, their own custom codes and programmings for how they put their platforms together so um, their training may be different than a different vendor's training on how to use their products. There's a lot of information on Vimeo. A lot of organizations are using Vimeo. Uh, very similar to YouTube, but it's more of, um, I would say it's more professionally put together than the random YouTube spots. Um, also, there are uh, resources on social media platforms, groups that get together and talk about what they're doing. You could find out a lot about uh, what works and doesn't work in specific industries. Um, if you're, you know, based on what type of ministry you do, you, you might find some information online there. Um, there's so much information, but um, I will get that, uh, a better list for you. Um, together uh, so that you can follow links in your own leisure. It's a, it's a very extensive list of where you can find uh, resources to build your online presence and train yourself on how to do that or prepare a team to build that online presence. Um, so, I welcome any questions. That's how we learn from each other. I know from my own experiences, but I'm not familiar with your experiences, so if you're online and want to ask a question, I'm uh, watching the chat. Anybody have questions in the room? Shannon, you talked about being a team, and there are probably people who they are the team, and and their online presence is what they can do in their spare time when they're not doing all the other jobs they do. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how, would, how would you have that person prioritize? Say they go into an organization that doesn't yet have a website or maybe even a Facebook presence. What's important to you first? Uh, I know of organizations that are only on Facebook, um, have a page there, but don't have a website. How important do you think a website is? Okay, so the question is sometimes the team is one person. And I'm very aware of this. Uh, I've been the team several times. And, and where does the one person team get started uh, when they have minimal presence or no presence to begin with. It's essential to have a website, especially since everybody doesn't want to be on social media mm -hmm. or can get to social media. So there are resources that you can build something simple. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to have the best graphics on it. It doesn't have to have the best, uh, you know, uh, GIFs on it. it it's something basic. It's just a little portal for people to go to to find more information. So your social media accounts, you want to kind of tease people and give them basic information, but you really want to put the guts of everything on your website. It is the phone book of your ministry or of your nonprofit. That's where people go to to find out anything. Your social media accounts are limited, whether it's because social media's algorithms have taken part of that or people aren't checking in, but your website should definitely be the priority. Other questions?
question here. Carol Poston said, can I speak more about the platforms and resources? Or will that be available in the materials that I'm putting together? So I am going to put a really good package together that will be available. Um, you will need to email me so that I know where to send the information. It will be one link that will take you to an online drive. And it will have the PowerPoint, uh, the link to this recording, uh, and a package of resources for you to look at. The web conferencing materials. Okay, so Google, uh, Google Hangouts I've used successfully several times and the reason I choose them when I'm using free resources is because how you can integrate other pieces of uh, your team's resources. So I'm on a video call with uh, three team members and uh, we need to review a document together at the same time. I can integrate that document into the call and we can look at it at the same time or an image or even a YouTube video. Um, it, there's chat options with Google Hangouts so if somebody doesn't have a webcam they can still participate with chat. Uh, it, it's a multi-platform um, technology so you could use it on Apple and Windows and different types of tablets. and. Basically, if you can get a Chrome browser running on <coughs> your device, the Google Hangouts will work. Uh, Skype is another platform that I've used and have confidence in. Uh, they've changed their technologies in the last year and a half. It's given me more confidence in them. So if uh, you want to do uh, video conferencing, you also can share your screen with Skype now without having to pay. Uh, and uh, Both Google Hangouts and Skype are uh, free user to user. Uh, Zoom is another platform that uh, I'm pretty impressed with, uh, but you only get to do so much before you have to pay. So uh, you might just want to take a look at their packages uh, if it's something that you're interested in. Um, Citrix is another one, but that's more for corporate sized uh, organizations. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it rarely you can do this, but if you can get all Mac users together, you can uh, you can do FaceTime. So, but you have to have all of them have to be iOS users. So, does that answer your question, Carol? More questions? Go ahead. So the best social media platform for what? Okay. okay. For, yeah. Generational. So, so different generations are using different social media platforms. Uh, I had mentioned before the younger generations think Facebook is for old people, um, but it's still an effective tool. So having a Facebook account and an Instagram is beneficial. Instagram is, is being used. Snapchat has become very popular. Um, so when you think about your online presence and these social media platforms, really focus on what images or short videos that you can share with your audience because they are photo and video driven uh, as opposed to content driven. Now what you want to do with these photos and videos on your social media is attach some link that goes to your website or to another social media account. You want to just keep all your stuff tied together and you want to repost and repeat all the information in as many po places as possible. So um, Reddit is, a, is very popular. Um, Reddit. Yeah. And then there are some open platform social media. So basically, People who just 
decided to create a social media platform, but they're not looking for advertisement revenue or anything like that. There's a few out there. Elo is one of those, so it's um, peer driven more than market driven, and it it's it kind of reminded when so the um, open platform social media platform that people are building reminds me more of like co-ops where people are sharing the, the weight and the responsibility of keeping the platform going and keeping it safe and keeping it free of ads and things like that that would start creating uh, where people would have to start charging or um, where money is involved. So this is, there's a lot of open source platforms that are more peer to peer than it is market driven. There's new ones popping up all the time and you know, I can tell you these five today and tomorrow, there's five new ones and those are obsolete. So really what you can do is just kind of, you know, uh, stay up with the news on what's going on with technology. Um, pay attention to the kids, <laughs> see what they're doing because they're, they're driving this. They, uh, by 2020, 90% of six year olds and younger will have smartphones. I think I read that somewhere. So, so the, it's a thing, right? <laughs> We're all, we, we do it, but 18 and younger, they know no different. So, yeah, I would just suggest just keep up with the technology news. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay, so uh, I have a couple more webinars scheduled for the spring and one specifically for social media and that is intentional because social media is such a broad subject, it needs an entire hour to itself. So uh, we will be looking closer at these different platforms, so uh, Kathy had asked, that's my fault, it's the moderator, I'm learning how to do webinars. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Kathy asked, you know, what are the best social media platforms, and that was my that was my response. So, this w the webinar on social media will specifically dig into those platforms and look at statistics of those platforms and, and strategies of using those platforms. But I left a big chunk of that out of this because it needs a whole session to itself. So that's coming up. Uh, we have another question online. The best way to stay on top of the newest resources is just, often I read Google's technology section. So every day they post news about technology. You can get, um, you can sign up for newsletters, uh, for updates and um, um, new technologies. You can, it's kind of a, a wormhole if you really want to get into it. <laughs> Because uh, once you sign up for one newsletter, then five other newsletters want you to sign up. And really, it becomes a bombardment of information the more you go after it. So I would limit yourself if you can, um, but maybe keep a folder of general tech information that you've subscribed to so that you can go through it on your own time. But there's plenty of uh, ways to get that information to you. Often you just have to start in on the process of signing up for it and then it, it will come to you. you spam's interesting. <laughs> okay. All right, invite anybody else online to ask any questions? If you have questions in the future, go ahead and email me and I can answer you the best I can or lead you to the resource that will give you the answer. Um, this is what I do. I connect people to what they need to get to in the technology world so that they can do what they need to do to better help people. So if you're not thinking of a question now and you're uh, online or you're here in the room, go ahead and feel free to email me. It's a lot of information. 
And again, email me if you want the link uh, to the package of downloadable content. And that'll be available on uh, the Monday after Thanksgiving. So the 28th is the day I'll be delivering uh, those packages email. So I'll welcome your, your email all next week. Anything else? CNET. Oh, okay, so someone online asked if CNET was a reliable resource. In a lot of ways. You can find a lot of information on the CNET. It's an online resource. Uh, I've yet to have issues with any resource that they've given me or any information they've given me, but you, you want to check with several. So you just kind of want to weigh out your options with what different uh, professionals are saying about what you're looking for. So, often, you know, they're very popular. They, they show up at the top of the list when you're searching for te technical questions, uh, but I'll, I'd say look at least three different types of resources to try to get a really good grasp of what you're looking for. Thanks, David. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the session. Um, look for me in the spring. Uh, this this is a new way for the Theological Commons to try to connect with the community and I appreciate your time here today. This was exciting and I hope you have a good afternoon. <laughs>